Well, he's used the word treaty, a potential security treaty between Papua New Guinea and Australia, uh, which apparently would be a formalisation of an arrangement which is already a very deep military-to-military uh, -military relationship that Australia has with PNG. Um, one current example of that, for example, is the Lombron Navy base on Manus Island, the same island where infamously um, Australian asylum seekers, refugees were being held. But uh, that happens to be a very deep water harbour that was a, a crucial strategic asset in World War II. And Australia uh, is spending $170 million some dollars with Papua New Guinea redeveloping that as a, a modern functional naval base. So a treaty would formalise and extend, one would presume, um, what already exists. But it's worth saying, Yvonne, that the Australian government's broader uh, approach to Papua New Guinea, although this would, of course, be a, a, a prized and welcome improvement on relations, the key approach they're taking is this, is across the Pacific, uh, as Australia now plays an extended game of chess against China for influence and power and strategic position, not to try to fight uh, fire with fire, if you like, so where the Chinese government has put $11 million uh, into an account uh, sorry, $90 million into an account that's available uh, to uh, the Solomon Islands Prime Minister to distribute to MPs, uh, that Australia can't match those sort of, uh, 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 shall we say, um, unaccountable payments, uh, that Australia should instead uh, try to work over the heads, of, if you like, of regional leaders and appeal to the populations in these countries. So that's why Anthony Albanese, for example, uh, has been working to try to create uh, an NRL team to bring Papua New Guinea into the NRL in Australia, while, while the Australia government, Australian government is working on improve, improving visa, visa access and labour mobility schemes for Pacific peoples to come to Australia to make us, the Australian connection so valuable to the public that governments will be reluctant to offend Australia. That's the larger scheme that the Albanese government is working towards. Fascinating indeed. What do we know about uh, the Solomon Islands Prime Minister Manasseh Sogavare's visit to Australia? And also, what's behind his government's announcement that the Solomon government uh, is, is putting a, a hold on US naval visits? Yes, yeah, so the US sent uh, a large hospital ship, um, the Mercy, it's called, which is, a float, is just that, a floating hospital. Uh, which arrived on Tuesday, and then um, immediately Papua New Guinea, uh, sorry, the Solomon Islands government announced um, a ban on any further US naval arrivals. Uh, this doesn't have a precedent in modern times. Uh, the uh, state owned or Chinese Communist Party owned, to be technically correct about it, masthead in Beijing, the Global Times, is claiming this as a model breakthrough for other countries in the Pacific to follow the Solomons in banning US Navy access. Uh, the Solomons is also banning Navy uh, and Coast Guard as well from the US. So China will, um, for good reason, count this as a very serious uh, victory. It's a diplomatic victory. Um, apart from anything else, it allows uh, China to now, I, you'd have to suspect, to claim the Solomon Islands as a client state so that when the Pacific Islands Forum meets, which is the big regional body that operates by consensus, China can now presumably use the Solomon Islands Prime Minister Sogavare to break any consensus. Now, the thing is that Australia and New Zealand are members of the Pacific Island Forum. It's a critical venue for influence and uh, diplomatic access. This uh, win with China now allows China to break consensus, to confound the Pacific Islands Forum, and obviously, it has future security and defence implications for Australia as well. And turning to the war in Ukraine, what is the latest in Kherson? How successful has Ukraine been in fighting back in this region? Yes, Kherson was the first major city that the Russians captured and it's been occupied ever since. But it's a sign of rising Ukrainian uh, capability uh, and ambition that the Ukrainians have now started a counteroffensive to try to take Kherson in the, in the south of the city back from the Russians. Now, there are conflicting versions, of course. It's a war. There's always going to be at least two sides to any development, uh, although based on the record so far, the Ukrainians have a much higher rate of accuracy and truthfulness in their reporting back. 
But the reports are that there have been breakthroughs, uh, that it, there have been Ukrainian attacks in at least 10 different positions, and there have been, there's been a regiment of Russians reportedly uh, withdrawn. Uh, so that is an important uh, development uh, that will break, potentially break the stalemate that's settled in on the southern front in Ukraine. At the same time, the Russians say that they are preparing or they are visibly preparing for an intensified assault in the country's east. So uh, while the Ukrainians are bracing to expect that in the south, they're waging a counteroffensive to take back a city that they lost. Will the boost to Russian forces that was announced earlier this week help their side in the war? What more can you tell us about the state of their troops? Well, they've announced, they've claimed that they're going to add 137,000 new troops, uh, which first of all tells you how depleted the Russian forces are, that after six months, they've got to step up such a huge uh, increase in their ground troops. The second thing is uh, that they've relaxed the age limit, so they're now recruiting um, old fellas. Um, the uh, mercenary groups are going from one prison in Russian to Russia to another to try to sign up, uh, you know, criminals and ne'er-do-wells, and um, uh, they're desperate. The Russians are absolutely desperate. What we've also uh, learned in the last week, two weeks, uh, Yvonne, is from a couple of published accounts, very detailed uh, Russian soldiers' accounts. Uh, one uh, fellow, uh, a paratrooper from an allegedly elite paratrooper unit, uh, Pavel Filiatov, has written a 140-page account of his experiences, which tells us, and he's had to leave Russia as a result for his own safety, but it tells us that morale is shocking, that the Russian troops are deeply confused about why they're there. Uh, it explains why there's no uh, morale or motivation to be killing people that they clearly see are not Nazis, contrary to what Putin tells them, that their supplies are a joke, that their strategy is in tatters, and that anything that you see reported or reported up the chain of command to Moscow is based on a bunch of lies and misrepresentations. So to answer your question about um, the, the importance of the 137,000, it's the, what we learn from, from these first-hand accounts increasingly is not to believe them. Really interesting accounts. Peter Hutcher, thanks so much for your insights. Really appreciate it. Pleasure, everyone.